Morning, everybody. So today we're going to get into chapter 9, <clears throat> but before we do that, I want to briefly talk about a reaction that we've already done. So let's say we have an alkene, and we do the oxymercuration demercuration sequence, mercury acetate, THF water, and then what's the second step? What do we need? What's the reagent? Okay, sodium borohydride under basic conditions, right? So we'll add some sodium hydroxide or something. What, what are we going to get out of that reaction? We're going to get a Markovnikov alcohol. No rearrangement. Very good. So two pentano, pentanol uh, in this particular reaction. At this point, you know that because I've taught you the mechanism, because I've told you this is what you're going to get, right? But how did they determine that this was actually the product? When they, when they worked through this reaction, how did they determine that it was this product and not that product, the anti-Markovnikov alcohol? They have different physical properties, okay? So, like what? Okay, melting points should be different. What else might be different? Boiling point might be different. True, but in this case, they'd be racemic though, so it'd be a difficult thing for us to, to measure. Imagine you're back in the early 1900s, you did this reaction. <coughs> what tools would you have had at that point to determine whether or not you went through a Markovnikov alcohol product or an anti-Markovnikov product? Didn't have GC. That's out. And gas chromatography, by the way, requires you to have a standard that you know so you'll know what the retention times are, right? So if you're the first person that ever made two pentanol, that's going to be kind of hard, right? You can't just go to your shelf and pick up a bottle of a standard and say you've got it. What might we have done? I mean, you know the techniques, TLC, that requires a standard. You know the GC, that requires a standard. IR hadn't been invented yet. And would IR be very useful here? Not particularly useful because it tells us what functional group we have, right? And both of those molecules have identical functional groups. They're both alcohols. Probably did make an educated guess, but educated guesses also need some evidence at the back end, right? What would you have done? Okay, you could have distilled it, but what would your argument have been? The boiling point? And then what would we have compared that to? We might have said, well, we know that primary alcohols should have a little higher boiling point than secondary alcohols. May have made that argument. What else could we have done to determine whether or not it was a secondary alcohol or a primary alcohol? Ah, very good. We could have done reactions, right? So what kind of reactions can we do with alcohols? What have we learned? You can do dehydration. That's one thing. There, that might be a little more difficult for us to get some usable information, but we could have done that. We can also do substitutions, right? What, if we take an alcohol and react it with HX, like hydrogen chloride or HBr, we do a substitution reaction, right? How could we have determined the differences here? How could that reaction have told us whether or not we had a secondary alcohol or primary alcohol? Okay, this can only do SN2. So the reaction rate would have been dependent on what? Yeah, so on both. This would have done... Could have, but probably could have done SN1, right? So we should have seen a dependence not only on the alcohol concentration, but also on the HBr concentration, right? So we could have done an awful lot of different things, is what I'm getting at, to try to determine which one we had made, all of which would have taken a lot of time, right? Because you would have had to use some type of reaction chemistry to determine what was going on. Fortunately, today we have NMR. <coughs> 
and NMR allows us to, ter to determine structure experimentally without having to go through and do a bunch of reactions, without having to have standards. So if they had had NMR back in the day, way back in the day, right, they could have used that uh, technique to determine whether or not they had the secondary alcohol or the tertiary alcohol by looking at its NMR spectrum and making arguments. There. Okay. So today we're going to get into talking about probably the most important technique in all of science, which is NMR. Okay. For those of you who are in polymer science, this is something you're going to use all the time. For those of you in chemistry, this is something you're going to use all the time. For those of you going on to medicine, you will use NMR, but you don't call it NMR in medicine. You call it MRI, okay? Uh, and so we're going to talk about today, we're going to talk about proton NMR spectroscopy, looking at hydrogens and how they're attached in molecules. And we're going to use that information to kind of get a glimpse at how we can do what's called structural elucidation. I've got a compound. I want to know what its structure is. I can use NMR techniques to do it. This class, over the lectures that we have, are only going to touch the very top surface of NMR spectroscopy. You can get PhDs in nothing but studying NMR spectra of things, okay? And so it's a very, very useful technique. If you went to a chemist, if you went to a polymer scientist and you said, I've only got enough money to buy you any one instrument that you want, each and every one of them would say, get, make sure we have an NMR. They'll sacrifice everything else to have that NMR because you can get so much information from an NMR uh, spectrometer, okay? Now, you all are familiar with this from the medical side. You all have probably either had or know somebody who's had an MRI, okay? You go into the hospital and there's a sign on the door that says MRI, right? That's magnetic resonance imaging. And when they do an MRI on you, really what they're doing is doing a proton NMR scan on you. What is most of the human body composed of? Nope. Water. It's mostly water. And what does water have a lot of? Hydrogen. And it turns out that hydrogens in different tissues give different frequencies in the MRI image. And that's how they build a picture. Okay? Now, it turns out that the MRI gives you a pretty little picture. Okay, so this is a, I think this is a spinal cord uh, MRI. You can see a lot of detail. This is kind of what the MRI machine looks like if you've ever had an MRI. This was such an important uh, discovery or, or development, I should say, that it was awarded, people were awarded a Nobel Prize for this, okay? Uh, and it went to uh, uh, a physicist uh, for actually uh, helping develop this type of technique. So physics is important in medicine, okay? It's not just there to, to torture you and uh, do those types of things. It actually is very, very important. And um, again, we can get pretty little pictures. Unfortunately, for organic chemists and chemists in general, the pictures aren't this pretty. Okay, what we get are pictures that look like this, that we have to interpret, okay? Does that look like a molecule to you? <coughs> I see a peak and a peak. Don't worry about that peak. That's a standard that they put in so they know where zero's at. Okay? But basically, yeah, this to me looks like this molecule because I've learned how to interpret these spectra. Okay? And so what you see is that this is the hydrogens attached to this methyl group appear here. And then the hydrogens attached to these three equivalent methyl groups on the T butyl appear here. And what you can see is that they appear in different positions. And you can use this so called chemical shift scale to determine what these hydrogens are ultimately close to. So in this case, these hydrogens are closer to an oxygen. These hydrogens are close to carbons, and that results in this difference in shift. Okay? So NMR is actually the MRI of organic molecules. We can get an awful lot of information from an NMR spectrum. This is an extremely simple molecule. It only gives rise to two peaks. Many of the molecules that we look at give lots of uh, signals that we actually have to look at and interpret. And fortunately today, there's a lot of tools that are out there to help chemists uh, interpret some of these complicated structures. But the structures that we're going to be dealing with in this class are simple enough that you can interpret them uh, yourself. Uh, and, and it's really an awful lot like putting together a puzzle. So we're going to talk about what all this other stuff means as we go on. So don't worry about the term NMR integration and all that stuff at this moment. This is, to a chemist, the same type of picture 
that a doctor looks at. Okay? Uh, so when you look at it, it's all NMR spectra. But um, anyway, so let's go on. So let's look at a real molecule. Let's look at something like ethyl bromide. Okay? Again, this peak at zero is called TMS, or tetramethylsilane. It's actually added to your sample so you can define what zero is, okay? Because you've got to know what zero is. And the NMR scale goes from about zero to 10. They're only showing out to eight here. Uh, it can go a little further than 10, actually. But for mo the most part, we call it zero to 10. And what do you notice about these two signals? One's kind of stronger than the other. Okay. What else can you tell me? If you look at this, these are single lines, right? What about these? These are multiple lines, right? And so if we look at the, at the blue signal, it's, this is it blown up so you can see, we see four peaks, okay? If you look at the, what is that, Pepto-Bismol colored, whatever, purple, uh, if you look at those three protons, they look like what? They look like three lines, right? These are one signal, but they are split <coughs> because of their neighboring protons, and that's important information to have. When we have four <laughs> signals that look like this, or four splittings within the signal, I should say, we call this a quartet. If we have three splittings within a signal that looks kind of like this, we call this a triplet. What would we have called the ones before on the previous slide? Singlets. So we're going to be talking an awful lot about singlets, doublets, triplets, quartets, quintets, and after that, we just call them multiplets for the most part, okay? So we're going to talk an awful lot about where these signals appear in the spectrum and how their splitting is. We're also going to talk about their uh, integration, and we're going to get a lot of information from, uh, from this, and we're going to be able to take these pieces and put it back together and tell us something about the molecule, okay? If you really like working puzzles, you're going to love this. So if you like working crossword puzzles, or anything like this, this is the ultimate kind of crossword puzzle where you get the pieces and you have to try to put them together using what you know about chemistry, right? And you already know an awful lot. You know that carbon can't have five bonds, right? You know that oxygen typically has two bonds. You know that hydrogen has a bond, right? And so using our, what I call chemical common sense, along with some additional information, we can actually put these molecules together quite easily. What can you tell me about A and B? in terms of their position. Okay, so A or B is at the lower PPM, A is at a higher PPM, right? Uh, yeah, we're going to talk about that. We have upfield and downfield. So this is an upfield shift, this is a downfield shift. Uh, what do you notice about A? What's what's attached to this carbon? A bromine. What about these were also further down, right? What's attached to that? An oxygen. So what's that telling us about being a little further downfield? Yeah, so things that are attached to more electronegative atoms typically appear further downfield. Things that are attached to more electropositive atoms are typically further upfield. And so we can get a lot of information about where a signal appears uh, and what's attached to it based on its shift. Okay? Now. I want to talk a little bit about how NMR works. Think about a proton, okay? We call them a proton, hydrogen. We call it a proton because that's what it's got in its nucleus, is a proton, right? And a proton is a charged particle. Everybody agree with that? It's positively charged, right? But it turns out that that proton in a uh, H1 nucleus spins like a top. So this little proton is sitting in the nucleus. It's not just sitting there like this, like we draw it on the board when we're talking about. It's actually sitting there spinning, kind of like the Earth is spinning. Okay. Now, if you take a charge and you spin it, what do you generate? You generate a magnetic field. That's exactly right. So when you were kids and you took a nail and you wrapped wire around it and you hooked it to a battery and you made an electromagnet, that charge was going through the wire, right? And it was moving, and that's... Someplace else to be, Sarah? No, oh, okay. Uh, All right. Okay. Oh, you thought you were going to be late today? So, okay. <laughs> so you generate a north and a south pole. You get these magnetic lines, 
right? Uh, just like a bar magnet, okay? So actually, the protons in water that are in your body are little tiny magnets. What do they put you in when they put you into an MRI? They put you in a big, powerful magnet. What happens when you take little magnets and you take a big magnet and you put it close to them? They will align. That's right, okay? And so, or at least they react, right? If I have a bunch of magnets on the, on the table and I come along with a big magnet, I can move them, right, pretty easily. And so we can use this type of phenomenon that we use with little tiny kitchen refrigerator magnets to actually get chemical information, okay? Because the proton actually spins, it generates a magnetic field. So you are a walking little magnet. You've got magnetic fields within you, okay, because of your protons. Okay? Now, it turns out that that spinning proton creating that magnetic field, just if it were out here without an external magnetic field around, the north and south poles would be pointed all over the place. Okay? So instead of calling these north and south poles, in chemistry we just draw an arrow, which shows the direction of the magnetic field. Okay? And so um, you have this random orientation of these little nuclear magnets. Okay? Now all of a sudden I come along with a big magnet, which is what B0 means, and this is all physics stuff, okay? So I don't want to get into the physics. But B0 is just a magnetic field. When I bring that big magnetic field around, there are only two possible ways that a magnet can orient. It's called quantum, okay? It's quantized. And you can either have uh, the magnetic fields of the little magnets aligning with the big magnetic field, or they can lie against it. They can't lie perpendicular to it or off to an angle. It's either up or down, okay? And for simplistic sake, that's really what we say in, in chemistry. We say it's either spin up or it's spin down. And it's just quantum. It's either here or there. It can't be in between, okay? So and it turns out that the bigger the magnetic field, the more of them, the, the bigger the, the energy gap between these two states will be. What can you tell me if you just count the ups and downs here? There are more ups than downs, but is it by a lot? No. It turns out that NMR is actually an insensitive technique. It's not particularly sensitive because you'll have a lot of them that align with, but you'll also have a lot of them that align against. And so there's a very little, small difference in the number of spins up and spins down. Okay? And so you have this energy difference, right, between the spin up and the spin, or spin up and spin down. So spin up is really in a line with or parallel with the magnetic field, and spin down is against it. The way that you can think about this is, is that the north and south poles line up perfectly here like you would have with, a, with two bar magnets, and here it's kind of like uh, having uh, both north poles facing each other, and so you end up uh, repelling. And so you have a low energy state, you have a high energy state, and we have an energy difference. That turns out that in the quantum world, if you're talking to physicists, this would be plus one half, this would be minus one half. I like spin up, spin down, but whatever, okay, it doesn't really matter. It turns out that this does matter. I shouldn't say that it doesn't matter, but for the purposes of this class, it doesn't matter, okay? So uh, if we know what this energy difference is, that tells us something about where that proton appears on the spectrum, okay? They all have different energies. And it turns out that we can measure this energy difference pretty easily, okay? We know how to measure energy differences quite well today. We have uh, computers, basically we have supercomputers that sit on our desk now, right? That can uh, detect these types of things pretty easily, okay? So, the take homes from this. In the absence of an external magnetic field, the two nuclear spin states have a delta E of zero. That is, they're random, okay? Um, but when uh, we have an increasing magnetic field, that energy difference actually grows. So if we're in the absence of an external field, it's going to be zero. There's no difference between the up and down states. But as we increase the strength of the magnet, the energy difference gets bigger. And for years, NMR, the space race in NMR was to get more and more powerful magnets. Okay, when I went to school, we were lucky to have what was called a 60 megahertz NMR which is kind of a tiny little machine. It's not much bigger than this, okay? Today, in, in our lab just down the hall, we have a 400 megahertz NMR, and that's considered small by today's standards. When I was at Vanderbilt, we had pretty close to a gigahertz 
NMR, which actually was big enough that you had to have a whole staircase built around it so you could climb up to the top. It was huge, okay? And as you get bigger in B0, the energy difference gets bigger, and that's good for us because we can detect these differences a lot more accurately than I can detect this difference. So I get more chemical information the larger the energy difference is, okay? So the big race has always been to get bigger magnets, and we have superconducting magnets that we use today that are actually uh, cooled by liquid helium, and so we can get very high magnetic fields and we can get the stuff that we need to see, okay? So there's the two spin states. This delta E, if you've had, um, if you've had uh, a physics, it follows this equation. Do not worry about reproducing this equation. I will not ask you any equation uh, for this on the exam, but what I want you to know is that the energy difference, okay, is proportional to B0. That's really what I want you to take away from this, okay? Uh, there's also this gyromagnetic ratio stuff, which is the state of the nucleus, blah, 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 H is Planck's constant, 2 pi, right? But really what's important from, from a chemist's point of view is the delta E is proportional to B0, which tells people who make NMR magnets a bigger magnet is better. That's really what this tells us, okay? And so we want bigger magnets, or at least stronger, I should say, okay? Now the way that these things work, this kind of looks like R2D2, right? This is the most boring instrument in the world, okay? It just sits there and does nothing, or it looks like it does nothing. It actually does a lot of stuff electronically, but it's just a big can, okay, with a bunch of wires coming out of it to a computer over at the desk. Now, this big can is important because it contains on the inside the magnet, which is superconducting, and superconductors have to be at really low temperature, and so to keep it at a really low temperature, we immerse it in a bath of liquid helium which is really expensive, okay? So we put it in liquid helium. What do you all know about liquid helium? It's really cold, right? It's as close to absolute zero as we can basically really get. It's pretty darn close, right? So a couple of degrees above absolute zero. So it's really, really cold. And when you place a material in something that cold, it becomes superconducting, meaning that the resistance essentially goes away and you can get huge magnetic fields, okay? Now, because liquid helium is so cold, if we just put it in this can by itself, it would evaporate really quickly. And it turns out that liquid helium is expensive and we don't want to do that. So on the outside of that internal can is another can, which actually holds liquid nitrogen. What do you know about liquid nitrogen? It's also cold, but it's not as cold as liquid helium, right? But it's a heck of a lot colder than room temperature, right? So there's actually a, a blanket of liquid nitrogen there to protect the liquid helium from the room temperature. So you have a doer with liquid helium surrounded by a doer of liquid nitrogen, and we have to replace the liquid nitrogen every week. Okay, it, it evaporates off, and so we have to go through and, and uh, put liquid nitrogen in every week. We have to fill it with liquid helium about every four to six months. Um, but liquid nitrogen is essentially free compared to the price of liquid helium, so it's, it's pretty good. And basically what this big computer does over here is um, sends a signal to the NMR that's a radio frequency signal, because all this is in the radio frequency region. Uh, and basically you've got these two spin states because you're in a big magnet. How do we get one spin state to go to the other spin state? We put energy into it. And so that's what we're measuring, the amount of energy that it takes to go from the lower state to the top state. And the way that we do that is we blast it with radio frequency energy, and we get out of that what's called a time domain, which then is transformed by Fourier transform into the frequency domain, which gives us an NMR spectrum. So for those of you who really like math, you can try to figure out how that happens. For those of you who don't like myself, you just trust it, okay? And it works really well. So uh, that's how an NMR basically works. And we'll have a demonstration next week where you'll actually get to see how the NMR uh, works firsthand. Okay, so now that we have kind of the five cent uh, understanding of how NMR works, let's talk about the practical sides of it, okay? We don't really care how the NMR works at this point. What we're interested in is can you look at a spectrum, interpret it, and get structural information. And there's some things that you just have to know here. It turns out that protons in different environments absorb at slightly different frequencies. 
So in other words, protons that are attached to a carbon, if that carbon is attached to an oxygen, it's going to appear a little further downfield than hydrogens that are attached to a carbon that's only attached to another carbon. Okay? So we can get some information about the environment that those protons are in. Okay? So that's what this one means. The frequency at which a particular proton absorbs is determined by its electronic environment. The size of the magnetic field generated by the electrons around the proton determines where it absorbs. Remember, electrons are also charged, right? And they're moving. They create a magnetic field, okay? And so if I'm attached to an electronegative atom, am I going to have more electrons around me or is it going to be more around the electronegative atom? And that's going to change where I appear on the spectrum, okay? Modern NMR spectrometers use a constant magnetic field strength and um, then they, they uh, uh, scan a range of frequencies and are able to determine where the protons are. Uh, only nuclei that contain odd mass numbers and odd atomic numbers give rise to NMR signals. Not every element on the periodic table gives you an NMR spectrum. But it turns out for us, we're very fortunate in organic chemistry because all organic molecules have to have at least one hydrogen. And most of them have a lot of hydrogen, right? So there's something there that we can see. Or carbon. Now it turns out that proton NMR has an odd mass number because it weighs one and it also has an odd atomic number, one, right? So it will satisfy uh, the NMR rule, so it'll be NMR active. Carbon-12, if we look at where carbon sits, what's the atomic number? It is six, which is even, and carbon-12, which is most of carbon, is also even. It's NMR silent. Its nucleus isn't spinning. It is just sitting there doing this. So there's no magnet, okay? However, we're lucky in that about 1.1% of all carbon is carbon-13, which has an odd mass number. Its nucleus spins, okay? And so it gives rise to magnetic fields, and we can detect that. We can also detect fluorine-19, and we can also detect phosphorus-31. And so these are kind of the common ones that organic chemists look to uh, to determine what kind of structure they have, okay? Now, the number of NMR signals that you're going to see is going to be equal to the number of different types of protons in a compound. We've talked an awful lot about symmetry, right? When we talked about our um, stereochemistry stuff, right? Very, very important here. Very important, okay? You're going to have to build models sometimes, okay? And so protons in different environments give different NMR signals. So if we look at dimethyl ether, the hydrogens here and the hydrogens here are equivalent. So we only get one NMR signal. Why are these equivalent? We have symmetry. What kind of symmetry do we have? We have a mirror plane, right? These three hydrogens are exactly equivalent to these three hydrogens. In other words, if I gave Gabriella a model of dimethyl ether and I told her to close her eyes and I switched it around and she opened it back up again, she could not tell that anything happened. They look the same, okay? Here, if we look at this molecule, chloroethane, are these hydrogens identical? Why are they not? There's no symmetry that relates them. This is a carbon with three hydrogens. This is a carbon with two hydrogens. Immediately, you know there's going to be a difference, right? And these three hydrogens are different than those two hydrogens, and so they will give rise to two NMR signals. Here, I've got HA and HC. Both of those are CH3s. They're both methyl groups, but are they identical in an NMR environment? No. That's right. This CH3 is attached to an oxygen. This CH3 is attached to another carbon. They are not related to one another electronically. They will give rise to two different signals in the NMR. And then, of course, this uh, carbon, the two hydrogens on it, are clearly different than the other two. So we're going to get three NMR signals, OK? Now, when you're talking about things like cycloalkanes, you've got to be very, very careful because a structure drawn like this will lead you to believe that there's only one, two, three environments. You have to draw it out in three dimensions. Are these two hydrogens equivalent? 
on this carbon, are, is this hydrogen the same as that hydrogen? Well, they're attached to the same thing. Why is this hydrogen different than this hydrogen? Exactly. This hydrogen is sin to the chlorine. This hydrogen is trans to the chlorine. How about this hydrogen and this hydrogen? Same kind of situation. How about this hydrogen? It's really different, right? And so if you think about this, you would imagine that there would have been a mirror plane through here, right? And you would have said these are equivalent and those are different. And so you would have said two environments. But by looking at it in three dimensions, I can see that this is unique, these two are unique, and these two are unique. So there are clearly three sets of non-equivalent, as we call them, hydrogens within that molecule. But drawing it planar, you wouldn't have seen that. So it's important to draw things in three dimensions. Now, if we looked at an alkene, if we used the abbreviated form, we could have drawn Cl, CH, double bond, CH2. But that wouldn't have told us the whole story. So we need to draw it out in three dimensions. How many signals are we going to have for this molecule? OK. Tell me how. How is this different than these two? It's on the carbon bearing the chlorine, right? How, why are these different? Right. This hydrogen is cis to a chlorine. This one is trans to a chlorine. That's right. So we're going to see one, two, three signals in this particular NMR spectrum. Okay? Let's look at a couple of other examples. Here we have uh, one, two dichloroethane. We only get one signal. What symmetry element dictates that? Mirror symmetry. That's right. Both CH2s are equivalent. Here we have, uh, how many carbons are there? Uh, three. So we have uh, one bromo, three chloro, uh, propane, and we're going to have three signals. They're all CH2s, right? Why are they different? That's right. So we have this carbon, which is bound to a, a bromine, and this carbon, which is bound to a chlorine. Those are clearly different. And then this carbon bound to the two carbons. So we have three different environments. What would happen if we replaced the bromine with chlorine? It would only have one? Two. That's right. Here's a, what's the functional group? Yep, we have an ester. We have two methyl groups, but we're going to see two signals because the hydrogens on this carbon are clearly in a different environment than the hydrogens on this carbon. This carbon's bound to a carbon. This carbon's bound to an oxygen. So we're going to see two different NMR signals. Now, here's our good friend ethanol. We're going to see three types of NMRs, or NMR signals. We're going to have the hydrogen on the oxygen. We're going to have the hydrogens on the methylene. And we're going to have the hydrogens on the methyl group. We will see three unique signals in uh, this particular NMR spectrum. Now, it turns out that for ethanol, they actually do use NMR to prove the purity of vodka. So if you get high quality Russian vodka, it can only have a certain water content, okay? And they will actually look, water has protons, and they can look at the, at the ethanol to water concentration very easily by using um, NMR. And you can prove that you actually got what you paid for if you have access to a $500,000 NMR spectrometer, okay? So actually that's about what they cost. The NMR spectrometers that we have down in our lab are about about $500,000. The new one over in polymer science that they got a couple years ago, I think was about $700,000, something like that. They're not cheap. The good news is, is that they last a really long time. We've got an NMR in here that's about 30 years old. They, 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 they are workhorses, so they're good investments. When you start trying to solve these NMR problems, there's a few things that you just need to do. There's a great way to solve these NMR problems and just follow these rules. The first thing you're going to do is you're going to count the number of signals to determine how many unique proton environments are in the molecule. I'm going to give you an NMR spectrum, and the first thing you need to do is just count the signals. On a multiple choice exam, you will be able to eliminate some things based on that information alone. If I give you a spectrum that has three signals, and you look at some of your molecules and you go, that should give me four, that should give me five, you know they can't be that molecule, right? So you can do some elimination. Okay. 
So if we look at this, how many signals do I have? I have three signals. One, two, three. Now this one right here, we're not counting. That's the standard, TMS. So always ignore zero. But I have one, two, three signals. Okay? If I gave you a molecule and you looked at it and you counted and you said that should have four signals, you know this can't be the molecule, right? So that's the first thing you're going to do. The second thing you're going to do is use chemical shift tables to correlate the pieces of the molecule. Now, the good news is on my exams, you're really not going to need to have a chemical shift table. You will need that in the lab because you'll have molecules that are a little more complicated to interpret. Okay? And we give you those tables. <coughs> but basically, if you look at this, this is kind of showing you where the hydrogens of different functional groups appear. Okay? So here's from 0 to about 10 to 12. Okay? What can you tell me? What, what jumps out at you? Okay, more electronegative atoms are going to be further down, right? Downfield, increasing de-shielding or downfield, right? Okay, what's the hybridization of the carbons here? What's the hybridization of the carbons here? What's the hybridization of the carbon here? Ah, we're starting to see something. What's the hybridization of these carbons? SP3, except for this one. And that's SP, right? So now tell me something. Where would you draw a line? Okay, I'm going to make it a little easier than that, but that's pretty darn close given what I've given you. Or round five. When I give you an NMR spectrum, the first thing that you need to do is find five and draw an imaginary line or a physical line. I don't care. And everything to the right of that, for the most part, is either going to be SP3 hybridized or SP. Everything to the left of that is going to be SP2 hybridized. Okay? Immediately looking at that structure that we have here, what can you tell me? There's five. That's right. There's no sp2 hybridized carbons probably in this molecule, right? So I know I'm dealing with sp3 hybridized uh, carbon hydrogen bonds. Okay? So that tells me a lot of information already. Things that are purely hydrocarbon are going to appear around one to one and a half. If you have an sp3 hybridized carbon that's attached adjacent to a carbonyl, for example, that's going to be a little further downfield. If you are a hydrogen on a carbon that is directly bound to oxygen, nitrogen, chlorine, okay, something like that, you're going to appear between two and a half and four and a half. And then after that, you're going to have your alkenes, your aromatic ring, and your carboxylic acids, okay, and aldehydes. We'll talk more about those a little bit later. But the first thing that you're going to do, draw a line at five, okay? And so that'll give you a whole lot of information to do, okay? So chemical shift tables won't be required on my exams, but they will be required in the laboratory, and we'll give those to you, okay? The next thing you're going to do is determine the integration of the signals to get an indication of the relative number of protons that are produced by each signal, or that give rise to each signal, okay? So this is what this is. This is called an integral line. How many of you have had calculus? What does the word integral mean? Area under the curve, right? What's the curve here? The peaks actually are the area or the curve, right? So I've got a, a peak. The area underneath that peak gives me the relative number of protons. But our NMR spectrometer can actually give us the integration. Who knew that an integration was simply just a line like this, right? That's all it is. And so if you take the height, and we used to when I was in school, you simply took out a ruler and measured the height from here to here, okay? And so if that was one centimeter, oh, and that turned out to be one centimeter, and this is one and a half centimeters. This tells me the relative number of protons. It does not, and I repeat, it does not give me the absolute number of protons in and of itself. I can get the absolute number if I know some additional information. But it tells me the relative. So what does this mean? It means that this molecule has three signals with a ratio of protons of one to one to one and a half. Can I have half a proton? Yes. 
No. Ah, exactly. So I'm going to multiply everything by 2, and I get 3 to 2 to 2. It's got to be a whole number, right? Can't have 1.75 protons, right? These? That's the integral line. Well, no, you probably, I mean, the, uh, in the old days, the spectrometer actually had what was called an integrating circuit, and you, and you took your NMR spectrum, and then you went back over it, and it would actually draw a line that gave a signal that was proportional to the number of protons, and that's where this came from, okay? And so you would, you would get these little lines, and you'd come through, and you would just measure the height. That's all it is. It's only for NMR, but yeah. Now, we've been noticing that we've got this strange splitting pattern going on. Some of them are like three peaks, and some of them are like two peaks, and so on and so forth. So let's see where this is all coming from. So imagine we have a molecule with two protons that are not identical. Okay, I know they look identical here, but HA and HB are different protons. These are going to appear as a pair of doublets. HA will be a doublet, and HB will be a doublet. Can you tell me why? the spin. It has something to do with that. Absolutely. What is HA near? It's near HB. And what's HB near? So HA is near one other proton. And so it appears as a doublet. HB appears, or is next to one proton, another <laughs> proton, and it appears as a doublet. Okay. Now let's look at HA and HB here. HB has two protons, and they're identical. And HA only has one proton. Now tell me what you see. HA is appearing as a triplet, because it's near two protons. And HB is still appearing as a, because they are near one proton. Are you starting to see a pattern? That's right. It's called the N plus one rule, OK? So it, n being the number of neighbors. If I have a signal that's near one neighbor, it's going to be n plus 1. One neighbor plus 1 is 2. That's why it appears as a doublet. This proton is near how many neighbors? 2. 2 plus 1 is? 3. This one is near how many neighbors? One. Doublet. That's the n plus 1 rule. OK? A neighbor meaning a different zero proton. Yes. Adjacent. For the purposes of this class, they are on just adjacent carbons, okay? Now, if we look at this example, HA is two protons, HB is two protons, so I should get a triplet and a triplet, and I do. Here, I've got two protons and three protons, and so I see a quartet for HA because they are near three protons, and I see a triplet for HB because they are near two protons, okay? And so here we have a situation where we have 1 and 3, so we should see 4 and 2, okay? We, I call these splittings. How the signal, this is one signal, but it is split into four because it has three neighbors. The signal where it's at in the spectrum tells me something about the electronic environment, but how it is split also tells me how many neighbors are near it. I'm starting to get a lot of information of how this molecule is put together an awful lot of information. I get more information out of this than I could ever get out of a GC or an IR or an HPLC, any other instrument. This instrument will give you more information than you care to really spend time looking at. And you can do a lot of really cool experiments to get a lot of structural information. Okay. So the fourth thing you're going to do then is you're going to interpret the splitting pattern for each signal to determine how many hydrogen atoms are present on carbon atoms adjacent to those producing the signals and sketch possible molecular fragments. Basically, rules one through four give you all the pieces to your puzzle. After that, you have to put the pieces together in a way that makes sense. You can't put your puzzle pieces together in a way that violates the rules that you know. In other words, if you start putting your pieces together and you go, well, if I had a five-bonded carbon, this would really work out, can't be. Or, hey, I could put this together and have an oxygen atom with six bonds. That'll really work great, right? You can't do that kind of stuff. You've got to follow the rules of valence that we know so well, okay? And believe me, today from watching the slideshow, you're not going to be able to do this yet. You're going to have to practice. 
and you're going to have to practice a lot, and that's why we have a lab devoted to it. So let's look at this. We've already determined that this molecule, right, is uh, three signals. We also know the molecular formula. They've given us that. It's C3H7Br. What else do we know? We know the integration, right? We know that it's 2 to 2 to 3. That 3 should be over there, okay? Put together a molecule that fits for this. Real quick, on a piece of paper. We've got a triplet. We've got, is that a triplet? Looks like a triplet. And we've got what looks like a triplet there. And then we've got one, two, three, four, five, six peaks there. How could you put the pieces together to get a molecule that would give rise to that spectrum? What'd you come up with, Obri? CH3, CH2, then what? So you would name that 1-bromo-propane? Yep. Does that fit the spectrum? 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, the integration works. Would I have only three signals? Yep, I would have three signals. Does the splitting work? That's going to be the CH3? And what should it appear as? It should, it should appear as a triplet because it's got two neighbors, right? How about this one's going to be the furthest one downfield, right? And it's going to appear as a, does it? Yeah. Now, how about this one? Where's this one going to be? Kind of in the middle, right? And how many neighbors does it have total? It's got five, so it's going to appear as six peaks, and that's exactly what we see, okay? Look at all the information we're getting. We're getting tons of information out of this particular type of exercise, okay? You can actually literally take your sample, go down to the NMR in five minutes, have all this information, but if you were trying to prove the structure of this without NMR, you would have had to have done a boiling point, maybe a freezing point. You would have probably had to react it with some nucleophile to determine whether it was SN1 or SN2. That could have taken you all day. But in five minutes, we determined the structure of this molecule by looking at the different proton environments that it has. Okay? And so we get these fragments. That's what we have here. And then Obri put them together for us using the chemical common sense that we all have. And voila, we have the structure. Okay? We're going to pick up back with this on Monday. Please read ahead. Have a great weekend.